Hello, I am Carol Turchik, Director of the Xavier Leadership Center. Welcome to the Take Your Job Search to the X Level presented by General Electric Credit Union and the Xavier Leadership Center. Both organizations share a mission to serve families, individuals, and communities across the greater Cincinnati region. And we're excited to do that through this eight session series to help you learn what works and what doesn't directly from professional career coaches, human resource executives, and hiring managers who work with some of the area's largest employers. Today's session is getting ready to talk to human resources, and it is led by our partner, Karen Lipscomb. Karen is a senior talent acquisition advisor specializing in workforce planning, diversity and inclusion, project management, and global HR consultation services. She's a, she has a proven track record of building high-performing work teams by aligning like-minded talent, providing proper support services, and facilitating ongoing collaboration with senior leadership. She has experience in recruiting senior and executive level talent for growing organizations. Karen, thanks for being with us today and sharing your wisdom and experience. Thank you so much. And I just want to uh, thank Xavier uh, Leadership Center for having me this morning. I appreciate it. And I just want to welcome everybody. And I hope this is interactive and, and fun for all. And so I know over the past few months, you have um, gone through the full cycle of, of the um, HR path um, with, with Xavier seminars and webinars. And I know you've created your brand. I know you understand how you can make an impact. Um, you've gone over how to create resumes that align with what the company is looking for. And also to uh, update your LinkedIn profile. And I know you've also prepared um, and practice how to answer the tough interview questions. And so um, we're going to kick it off with an exercise. And I'd like to know um, from your perspective, and you can put the answers in the chat, um, what is something that if you could look behind the HR curtain, you would want to understand about the HR hiring process? And so Carol's going to play some music, and she's going to probably give feedback from some of the chat. And um, we'll get yeah, right we'll, back. We'll take a couple minutes um, and then just start chatting as you're finished, but take a few minutes to reflect. Okay, we're getting some really great responses. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, Karen, some of the topics, um, and I will let you know that our next session is on negotiation, so we don't have to go okay. a lot into that. Okay. But, um, but some of the questions here are some of the things here are um, do they always want to go to the lowest salary possible? or is there a budget that has flexibility? So some other ones are um, the actual selection criteria being used to vet candidates. Um, uh, what parameters are used to select the best candidates? So let's see, Th this is a really good one. Um, how much does HR really understand about the position they're interviewing for? Uh, I, I, they know it's the, to get the best candidate, but really how much are they knowing about the position? So I think that's a great, great question. Um, again, how much negotiation? Um, do the HR groups create measurements or a grid of key job requirements um, and give higher points to the person who meets those? Like how does that selection criteria kind of work? Um, so yeah, let me start with the lowest yeah. budget possible question. Um, so the way we uh, uh, approach salary is that we're given um, the salary metrics by uh, research from one of our compensation um, directors. They provide us with uh, compensation ranges. And some of the things we have to uh, consider is geographic locations. Um, we have to consider um, if you're, you're senior, intermediate, or uh, entry level. We have to consider those, but we are definitely given a range, and we do not want to go with the lowest range. We want to factor the geographic numbers, the uh, experience, and then the internal equity in order to um, <clears throat> consider what salary we're, we're going to pay. And so also, you know, there are some um, states who 
kind of shun we, we don't requ they don't require that you disclose what your current salary is but our expectation is that you do research and you got different places where you can research salary.com different compensation places or things that you can google to figure out what kind of range you should be in and so we honestly expect you to tell us what you think you're worth and sometimes you know if you can provide information on why you feel that way then we'll take that into consideration and so sometimes we have some flexibility in negotiating salaries great um and then some of these other things that were written in here karen i think we will address in the um in the presentation okay and i did want to speak on one other thing and that was about does the person in hr really um know uh the details of the job and so uh, a majority of us in hr uh, mostly recruiters we will get as much information um, during our job launch um, as we can about whatever what the environment the um the situation is we'll get all of the background information um, there are different types of recruiters some are just recruiters and then some are kind of like talent acquisition and then some of us have industry related experience and so we could at least do an initial screen for behavioral fit cultural fit and some technical questions and make an inform um we'll, we'll provide the uh, hiring manager with information on the candidate so perfect so in terms of who we are and who we are not um human resources we're here to attract the right type of talent the right skills the right time um we're we're our, we're here to motivate and develop employees we're here to find the best fit for the organization so that we can remain competitive because you wouldn't be in business most of the time unless you want to be competitive and and have a successful business um, but we are not here to kind of shortchange or discourage you from being the best you can be. And I know a lot of times um, there are some situations where HR is not positively reviewed, you know, viewed. But in most instances, and in most of the places I've I've worked, uh, we have given a sincere interest in employees and 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 whatever is going to be best for them. So here are some top five reasons for not getting a position. Um, one is that you're, you're possibly overqualified. And to be honest, I don't really 100% um, agree um, with this particular uh, bullet. However, um, if you have a master's degree in, um, and you're a rocket scientist, I wouldn't expect you to apply for a customer service position. <laughs> you know, so that's that's a real mismatch. Um, however, there are some cases where you can use a cover letter to kind of explain why you have decided to apply. And in, and in some cases, we view cover letters, especially if we see a, such a mismatch. Um, and then there are times where you're underqualified. Um, you really should be applying for jobs that you're 90% of fit for. Um, competition's pretty fierce. And so um, if we get 200 applicants, uh, it's highly unlikely that we're gonna go to uh, view 200 resumes. So you wanna make sure that you're 90% fit for that role. Um, and then there are other instances where you're focused on too many positions. So for example, um, if you apply to a cyber engineer with my company and then you apply for an electronic engineer uh, or four others, I can honestly see all four um, applications. 
And so what that tells me is that you might just want a job and, and um, it's a good way to turn off an employer. Because I've heard over the span of years, well, she applied to 20 jobs. And so we know that you really not, you're really not wanting all of the jobs that you apply for. Um, and there are some cases where your resume is, is kind of sloppy. Um, you want to pay particular attention to this because it could make or break whether or not you're in the top four or five candidates. Um, have someone look over your resume to make sure it's free of errors and, and uh, your fonts, that's a common one, the fonts are mismatched in a lot of cases. Um, and then the last one is that you can't explain why you were uh, no longer in the position. Um, and the best thing here is to just be honest. Yeah, and uh, Karen and I talked about this earlier and, um, you know, right now there's uh, COVID, there's a lot of reasons why people are not in their position. So it really is being honest about why you're no longer there. Um, if you were let go, you probably do need to have a story around that as well um, and being honest about that. So, um, you know, we just talked about that offline that there's a lot of reasons right now that you can yes. be honest about. Yeah, for sure. So what we need to know is, have you researched who we are? Um, this is one of the most common issues I have when I'm doing a preliminary screen. Uh, I've called candidates who've applied for roles and they'll say, well, which company is this? That's a red flag. Uh, or they will say, um, well, I did some research, but I can't remember what you guys do, can you tell me what you do? Um, that is a red flag for me because what I believe is that you're not really taking into account of a company that you consider yourself interest, interested in. And so um, we're getting to know you, you're getting to know us, but I would expect that you would want to know a little bit about us uh, and buy into what we have to offer prior to getting on the phone with someone from Human Resources. Um, that you understand what we need. So you need to review the job description and to be able to tell us why you are a fit for the role. Um, when you review the job descriptions, one of the things you can do is go through a few of those items and kind of jot down some notes on how it's relevant to some of your experiences and some of the things you've done um, in, your, in your role. So, and that we need to know that hiring you is a safe bet. And so we can conduct interviews where, and we can sense through our conversations whether or not you're one confident um, whether you're enthusiastic, um, and then we'll ask probing questions about your stability, um, your job movements, and your loyalty. We don't want you after four months to uh, be in a vice president position if you're kind of entry level. Um, and so those are some of the things that, that, that we would need to know uh, from you as a candidate. And so here are some of my top uh, interview questions. And um, when, when I say, you know, tell us about yourself, I'm looking at where you're starting from and I wanna see where you're ending up. And I wanna see if you're concise and I wanna make sure that you're hitting just kind of your highlights. <clears throat> and we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but uh, I want to see some of the things that you're proud of and some of the accomplishments that you, you've made in your, your, hiring, your professional career. Um, the last non-academic book, this is interesting. Um, we, we don't read as much anymore, and this is not a deal breaker. However, I think it's interesting to kind of uh, uh, have that conversation 
to see what you learned uh, um, as you as you read from time to time. Um, of course, you know about the short term and long term goals, uh, why you might be better than the other candidate. Um, this one, it kind of gets to the human element where it's what is the biggest mistake you've made or any challenges you've had in your professional career. This kind of opens up the door for more conversations about why you uh, may have left company A to go to company B, for example. Um, there's a teamwork and leader and follower. I've had, you know, folks to say, I'm a follower and here's why. And that was more my like programmer types. Um, they're not interested in upward mobility. They want to code. So there are different scenarios where it's good to be a leader. It's good to be a follower. Um, and, and we don't necessarily frown upon it, uh, but then there are different tracks you can take to, to move around the company, and they're not always in management. And then um, what kinds of experiences do you have working with others with a different background? And what I'm trying to gather here is uh, your exposure to diversity. Um, and, you know, it kind of does expose some of the things you, you might feel about working with people who are different. We want to make sure you're kind of a little bit out of the box thinkers and that you see kind of diversity as uh, additional creativity and more than a positive than a negative. And then um, one of my favorites is tell me about a time when you were asked to do something against your morals. Um, this is very key, especially in the defense contracting business. You're going to be doing a lot of government work. You're going to be exposed to a lot of kind of unclassified but uh, secretive information. And we want to make sure you guard and safeguard our intellectual property. So, and then how would your prior manager or colleague describe you? I think that's a really good one. Um, it's kind of hard to uh, determine that, but I think most of us know uh, in the past or even presently how our, our colleagues or um, managers perceive us. So now we're into exercise number two. Um, what is a question you have asked or you could ask in an interview to see if the role or the company is the right fit for you. And again, um, add your answers to chat and Carol's gonna play some music and she's gonna come back and give us feedback on some of the uh, responses. Yeah, and feel free to share if you had an experience where you asked a really good question and got a good response or the HR people were kind of impressed with that. Just share, share those questions um, so we can learn from each other. So great responses. Um, a lot about just asking the direct question, you know, what is the company culture like here? What's the department culture like? Um, some other ones, um, uh, explain your learning and development program or, or what does that look like? Um, what is your company's overall growth plans for the next three to five years? Um, what's the differentiator between you and your competitors? Um, Let's see, what do you, yeah, growth trajectory, uh, let's see. How does the position, I like this one, how does the position contribute to the organization's success? Um, what do you hope, what do you hope to accomplish? You know, what the uh, 60, 30, 60, 90 days, what would you want to see this person accomplish? Uh, why did you join the company? So that, that's kind of an interesting question. Um, and are those reasons still true today? So the great answer, great questions. That's a trip up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, let's see, one more maybe. Um, how are people valued here? Um, let's see. Uh, what is the preferred or what is the overall leadership style here? So good, good responses, thank you. Yeah. Um, one of my favorites is um, 
And this is toward the end of the interview where they ask, is there something about my background um, that I can answer that we did not cover? Or are there any concerns about my background that we can address now? And that and most of the time, they'll be honest with you and say, well, I think you're a little light in X, Y, Z. And so what that does is it gives you the opportunity to say, well, we didn't discuss it, but I did X, Y, Z for three years at company A. So I think it's one of the um, really, really good questions that where you're removing all doubt before you move on. And so here is critical, is, this is critical. Um, I just want to share this uh, with you for a takeaway. Um, and some of them you've covered already, but then I think it's a really, really good um, uh, a takeaway for you. And then, you know, in case you run out of questions, you can have this to uh, refer to. And it really does tell a lot about the company. Um, so one of the ones I like is the, um, the accomplishments, like one of the, uh, chatters stated, um, what do you want to see accomplished in the 30, 60, 90 days? So that kind of tells you, you might have to get, get in and hit the ground running immediately. So, and then that also shows you why that role is critical to the, the functioning of the organization. And this one, um, to your own, own horn, just don't blow it. <laughs> um, we as human resources uh, professionals and hiring managers, we expect you to kind of tell us, you know, in a nutshell, why we, we should hire you. And we should all have a short elevator pitch about ourselves to be able to say, I've spent 15 years in human resources. I've spent 10 years in HR, in, in um, information technology, for example. Um, I created a process map flow chart for the organization that's in use now. Or I revamped their immigration plan. All of these were opportunities to continue to sell yourself um, to, to the organization. And I would not look at it as bragging. Um, it shows confidence, it shows that you know yourself, and it shows that you are solid about what you can bring to the organization. Um, so after the interview, um, it is proper to send a thank you note or email. You can either mail it or email it. Um, those are both acceptable forms of, of a thank you. I've gotten um, candy, I've gotten roses. It's a little bit overkill, but I'm like, thank you. I, I'll remember that person um, um, after the interview. So um, be able, you know, just have some, um, don't be afraid to discuss hiring time frames. So, um, how many people are you considering for this position? And where are you in the interview process, for example? Uh, we just started, or you're our final person that we're interviewing, so we should know something in the next week or two. Um, you can follow up with myself within a week. Um, I should be able to give you some type of feedback. And then in this, in, you know, in this time, we got people working from home, we got hiring manager schedules all over the place. And so sometimes we simply need time to collect the information and get the rating. Um, and then ask your interviewer when um, you should expect next steps um, and kind of hold them to it. And, and I've had folks reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm not opposed to that at, at, at all, so. So Karen, uh -huh. so Karen, just real yeah. quick. So, so chat's been blowing up about this burning question. And this is, we kind of okay. just, so I think there's a lot of questions right now around, you know, 
ghosting is what people are calling it. So they, they apply, they may even have an interview and then just never hear anything back. And so I think people struggle with the balance of, do I continue to follow up? You know, what is the reason that we don't hear back? Um, there's another question, you know, um, yeah, especially after an interview. I think people may understand after, you know, you send in a resume and people don't hear, but that's even a question. And then especially after an interview, what are your thoughts on that? So there are a few scenarios where um, you don't hear back. Sometimes they have pulled the funding. Um, and, and so I work in defense and we, we do requisition sometimes where um, we're looking for talent, but what we're supposed to do is say, this is an evergreen rent. And that's, that's a designation that says, we're looking until we win this contract. It should be specified that this is evergreen and we're sourcing for it. Um, there are other times where it's just simply workload. Uh, there are times where um, you had two stellar candidates and you're waiting for a vice president approval and he's in Switzerland. Um, in my opinion, it is unacceptable after an interview not to provide some type of feedback. Um, and, and there are times where some might slip through the cracks, but they shouldn't. And so it is, it is unacceptable in my opinion not to provide someone with feedback who has interviewed and taken the time out of their schedule to uh, learn more about your organization. Yeah, we do know what happens. Um, and I think there are probably, um, as you and I talked also, Karen, about um, sometimes it the process takes longer than expected. Yes. yes. Um, and then from a candidate perspective, I've been on the other side. Um, I've been ghosted and a lot of times um, people who are in the HR function at times, um, they have, a con they have um, issues with giving negative feedback. Um, and, you know, once you've been in HR for a long time, you, it's, it's proper. It's just something that, that we should do as human resources professionals. Great. What Karen, what do you think is the is it probably an expected time frame to hear back from interviews? I would think within a week or two. It just depends on which candidate you you are. If you're if you're number three, then you're the, the third one, then it should be at least a week before you know whether or not you've been uh, selected or not. Great. Thanks. All right. Um, so this last slide is just something somewhat of a reminder about um, the interview process. It's going to, you know, show you or encompass the entire uh, interview process from start to finish. And it's a really, really good uh, video. Uh, and as you can see, I took this screenshot because I like his background. Um, I like the, the seed in the background, the plant to the right. It's very professional. And uh, we have to be sure that uh, now that we're, our new normal is, is video, uh, we have to be sure that we remove any distractions, um, turn your cell phones off uh, completely uh, free of distractions when you're, when you're interviewing. Um, because I've been in interviews where the person brought a Subway sandwich and proceeded to eat the sandwich during the interview. It, is, it, was, it was comical. Um, needless to say, uh, when I got the feedback, they, they you know, we're, we were all puzzled. It was, it was one of my top 10 moments to see in HR. So, um, just little strange things like that, you wouldn't believe um, if they happen. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so there are a lot of different tools out there. There is one that we discussed a few minutes ago, um, 
to where it's West, West Elm Zoom, and you can Google it, and it gives you some professional backgrounds to use um, when you're interviewing. It's a bunch of templates that you can use uh, to make sure your, your uh, background is professional, um, because we don't want to see clutter. And it's amazing what's happening now. It's like you, you might watch CNN or MSNBC, and they're at home and you can kind of see their homes and you know some of the things they have sitting around the, the, the house, it, it's kind of strange. So uh, yeah, just you know, um, watch your branding and uh, make sure your body language is good. And um, just, we can put this video link uh, so that you guys will have access to it. And view and to view it later. Yeah, so it'll be in the follow up email that we send. Okay. Yeah. So I think we have um, some time for some questions. And I think um, we talked about just having Karen here with us is a great way to have access to that internal HR person. So um, I do, I did just get a good question, Karen, for panel interviews. Um, yeah. What's the best way to handle the eye contact? So do you focus on, you know, sometimes you look at your camera, sometimes you kind of look at the person talking. How does that, how does that work? Or I, we're probably still trying to figure it out, but. <laughs> yes. Um, I try to look at the camera. Um, and then, you know, there are times like during this seminar where I'm writing notes and that's acceptable. Um, but mostly focus on the person that's directly asking the question right in front of you. Okay, great, great. Um, so someone asked about green screen. So um, if your computer doesn't have a green screen, you won't be able to have a professional background or a, a picture background. So you will need to make sure you're in a spot that's appropriate for an interview. Um, if you do have a green screen, you can download any picture. But I think Karen's point, you know, you don't want, you know, flowing water and a palm tree and all kinds of things happening in the background. You really want the most professional background that you can have for that session. Okay. Um, so any other questions? Um, we also talked about um, cats and dogs and kids and that's, such a wonderful human part of our new world, but probably in an interview, if there is the ability to limit that during the actual interview, it probably would be a good idea. Absolutely. Yeah. There was an interview. We had an intern. It's, this was at a prior company and we had an intern and he was on Skype and there were five engineers in the room uh, discussing his background and his cat crawled up on his neck and the cat's tail was kind of blocking him from talking and you could see how embarrassed he was because he couldn't get the cat to to leave so um Think that was that hilarious time, right that was kind of funny so right right yeah. um great yeah so um another question is if you, at the end, when they ask if you have any questions, what's a, a, an appropriate amount, a number of questions to probably ask? So majority of your questions are probably answered during the interview, but I would expect, a, you know, three to five, kind of keep it, you know, concise. Perfect, perfect. Uh, let's see here. Um, any other behind the curtain questions? Yeah, I think um, I think the big thing is you know asking those questions. How? What can I expect as follow up? Right? And maybe the person says, you know, we have a lot of candidates, and it, it you know, we may not get back to everyone, or maybe they will share some light on the process. I think asking that process is a, is a fair thing to, to ask. So someone asked another great question, you know, how do you get at the answer to understand the fit about work-life balance? So what's a good question to ask 
to really assess kind of that, their thoughts on work-life balance. So in the time of COVID, we have had to be extremely flexible. For example, I've been at working remotely since March. Um, they have allowed us, well, they said, you know, come back to work. Um, you're on the green team or the red team. Um, and so what has happened is companies have had to be a lot more flexible about the work from home because now you have kids at home and you're having to set up their computers so that they can, um, um, you know, work, go to school as well. So um, one of the questions is, um, do you have flex time? Um, as long as I put in eight hours, are you okay with me um, going out for an hour, walking the dog, or um, contractors are coming over to patch up some issues here at the house? Just simply ask, you know, about flexibility, flex time, and um, just discuss any extracurricular activities you have. Because I'm, I'm a member of a couple of organizations and they don't, they're not really all that concerned as long as I put in eight hours or if I can't do the eight hours, just schedule time off. Um, and then some companies are flexible about giving an additional week of vacation as well. So uh, they're definitely on the table questions that I would not uh, shy away from. Yeah, and I, maybe framing them around, you know, how has this changed and what does it look like now? Absolutely. Um, yeah, because everybody's figuring that out, right? Great question. Um, another one is, um, how do you how do you truly get at, or maybe there's what questions, or how do you truly get at understanding the culture of a potential employer? Well, one of the companies that I was working with um, they were proud about winning best places to work. Those designations are on Glassdoor or they're on some type of marketing material. They really, really bad bragged about retention. And so a good question is, what's your typical retention level? Um, and then typically, why do people leave the organization? Um, that's going to expose a lot of things about the organization. Um, sometimes you, you know, when you're, when you're in the interview process, you can ask, is this a replacement or is someone being promoted or transferred? Those are valid questions to ask on the front end um, and, and during the interview process as well. That'll kind of highlight uh, the company's ability to retain talent. Um, a lot of times when you read those glass door reviews or those indeed reviews, there's some element to truth about them. So mm. if you hear a lot of chatter about disgruntled employees, typically that's a cultural issue. Yeah, that's a great, great thing to learn. So someone just asked, and I think maybe you said this earlier as a way, if you knew someone, is it appropriate to ask to speak to someone who uh, was in the previous position or works there? Um, I have not had that uh, happen. However, there are times where we will bring, so for example, if it's a, a senior uh, programmer, we will bring in another programmer, um, do kind of like a 360 thing where we have someone that would report up or someone on that level, um, try to get a pretty good cross-functional team to, to put, before, put before the candidate so they can get a view. And then some companies prefer one-on-ones and some prefer the panel style. Um, I find the one-on-ones to be very, very uh, instrumental in kind of getting to the bottom line sometimes. However, the panel, um, you know, you're in the room with a bunch of folks, it's more efficient. However, you know, some of the employees might be less apt to uh, share things uh, as it pertains to 
the company versus the one on one. Great, great. So someone asked, um, uh, here, uh, let me find it here. Oh, um, they heard that companies are giving lower salaries because of COVID and the hiring pool is larger. Would you find that, what, would you find that to be true or do, do you feel like that does happen? Um, I saw a trend about a year or two ago where the salaries have dipped maybe $10,000 or more and for some positions. Um, and then that does put more uh, people into the process. Um, and now with COVID, they're, they have fewer staff. Um, and then say, for example, Wendy's, for example, you don't have the full, uh, you know, employees there. You have just a fraction of who's there. And so you can get away with just drive through. You're not, have, you're not having people serve or cash registers and, and stuff of that nature. So yes, I think the trend may have started before COVID, but it's even more prominent now. And so we're getting the pick of the, you know, of the chain here with we're getting the best for our bucks and we're able to pay less. Um, right. And then that, you know, that goes a little bit and not to get political, but then that, you, you know, we're at full employment. Well, we could be, however, people are piecing together a couple jobs to, to make ends meet. So yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Great. So another qu great question in a live interview, is it okay to take notes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Um, so I think you had said earlier, we, we talked about it at least, if you do know somebody at the company and you find them on LinkedIn or you know them, it, I think it's appropriate to really get an idea from them what they think about the position, the company, all of that. I, I would think that's great research. Absolutely. And a friend who's, he's in HR, he lives in Columbus. He actually Googled the company and, and saw that one of his frat brothers worked for the company. He didn't know this particular frat brother, but he called and says, hey, what do you think? And then post interview, the frat brother called him back and said, hey, you interviewed really well. Here are a few more pointers to, right. to you know. So, and folks reach out to me in my inbox all the time. And if I can help even forward their resume to another recruiter within my organization, I'll do that because it's less work in trying to find really good top talent. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, always have a good to have someone on the inside. Yeah, any other questions? Thanks for this. These I think are helping probably everyone. Um, uh, so someone said, um, how much do you all use LinkedIn to search for people or to put stuff up about the company? So how, what kind of a tool would you say that is? And is that the best tool? I use it on a daily basis. My company has paid the uh, five or six K for me to have a seat. So I'm out there looking all the time. What I find is I don't get a lot of response back when I um, go out to seek. I find the talent, I get fewer responses. And so because I'm in the defense contracting business, I use a board called Clear Jobs. That way I can go straight, the phone numbers are displayed, their top secret clearance levels displayed, I can get to the candidate much faster. Right. But LinkedIn is very good. I think if folks would use it, um, go in and put, you know, update your profile like you had in the prior session and use that box that if they say you can only choose 50 skills, if you have 50 skills, choose them all because a lot of things are based on algorithms and Boolean searches and those with those skills, they float to the top. No, that's a great response. And as we talked in an earlier session, some people use it to search things, but they don't realize that the inbox, so, so recruiters may be reaching out and they don't realize that they've 
been reached out to. So it's always important to check your, your messages um, on that. So yeah, great. Um, so, so back to ghosting. Um, uh, how many follow-ups before you say, you know, like, okay, enough, like you, you know, what, what does that look like? Um, if you have to do three follow-ups, it's highly unlikely that you're going to get a response. Um, and then in some cases, employers are reluctant to give feedback to uh, legally. Uh, I try to find, um, I provide feedback as much as I can because I think it helps for closure. We need closure. <laughs> so um, I try to give feedback and uh, make sure that when we collect the interview uh, responses that the managers have put in the system, that I'm kind of getting some of my information from that. Um, and we, you know, I want to see the best in the hiring manager. I want them to say, well, the guy was good, except for his energy level, we had to pry information out of him. And so my response to the candidate would be, you know, you have to probably show a little more enthusiasm um, about the role. Uh, we couldn't get a lot of answers from you. So we're just, we decided to, um, you know, move on. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so, so great questions coming in here. Um, if you're busy when a recruiter calls or like you're the internal HR person calls as a follow up or something, is it a strike per se to say that, can I talk to you at a different time or how should you handle that? There, it is not a strike. It is not a strike. I will send you an email. I'll call you and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about a, your background. Give me a specific time where you can chat. I don't expect you to kind of answer me right then and there. Um, and then if I, um, if, even if I set up a time for us to chat, the first thing I ask is, is this still a good time? Because things change. So uh, I want you to have an opportunity to go do your homework, do your, you know, check about the company. I don't want to really do it on the fly. I want to give you an opportunity to set it up, set some time, and um, if I need to call you back, I have no, no issues with that whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, obviously you're gonna wanna be positive and say, oh, I'm very excited to hear from you, or, you know, right. some of the things, <laughs> not just, hey, I'm busy, but yeah. <laughs> um, so what about people who are like um, overqualified, underqualified? I think you said, you know, in your cover letter, that's kind of a way to, to clarify some of that maybe, but how do you talk about transferable skills? So somebody who may be switching industries or maybe realize they're overqualified, underqualified, like how do you address the transferable skills thing? You mean in terms of what questions do I ask them? Yeah, or how do they, how do they prepare and, and help you understand those transferable skills? Uh, so for example, let me see. Um, So if you're trying to get into HR, for example, um, have you, for example, have you gone to take your SHRM um, certification? Have you um, used like Outlook tools, for example, in setting up interviews? I mean, I can hire anybody as an HR rep if you have the basic office skills. To me, that's transferable. And that's one of those bottom line things that's, that you can use in almost any industry you go to. So if I want an HR rep, can you do the basics? Can you provide good customer service? Can you follow up? And can you use the office tools? Can you give me a report from Excel, for example? Um, you don't have to always have that particular you know, five years in HR, well, what have you done? And to be honest, we honest, I honestly look at your extracurricular activities or some of your volunteer work. Those are very good transferable things because I've been on a number of boards and they've enhanced my, my personal skills. Um, for example, I started off in IT 
but I, I didn't really like the, the programming database aspects of it. So I went and got my HR degree and my first job out of school was at an organization like Target, for example, but they needed someone with um, HR skills and then IT skills as well. So it was just a good marriage. And that's how I was able to get into uh, an area where I had no experience. And I did a lot of volunteer work for some organizations that were IT and HR. So um, don't overlook those, those voluntary uh, uh, professional organizations because that's how you get a lot of transferable skills. Yeah. So this is a good last question. I think that, I think we've had this question over the whole se uh, season, if you will, <laughs> sessions. Um, do you have an applicant tracking system and, and how about the screening out but based on resumes? Like how should people really think about that screening process? So um, applicant tracking systems are algorithm based in most cases. They're gonna pick up keywords. They might go past, like if you have a table, for example, in your resume, it might go past that because it's not really picking up a table. Now, if you use pipes, and that's a signal that's right above your inner key, um, they may pick up keywords, but a lot of it is based on keyword search. And so uh, some of the ways to get around that, and we, you know, you brushed on it before, is use the job scan um, tool. You can put your, job description in there, put your resume in there, and it's going to tell you what you lack. And so you can think, okay, it says I lack marketing, but I did an entire marketing plan for uh, the, the human resources department back in 2015, you see. So, um, and then there's also uh, pre-screen questions where I can eliminate when I think I'm going to get 200 applicants. And the first question, and it's going directly from the job description, do you have five or more years in electronic engineering? If you say no, then it may kick you out or put you lower in the, in the, uh, the queue, for example. But good applicant tracking systems are algorithm based. Yeah, and I think that goes back to the um, last week's session actually about um understanding the job description and really absolutely tweaking your resume every single time to make sure that those words are aligning with the top things they're looking for and um and making sure that those words are in there yes yeah, so there's an area that you can put in your resume called highlights of qualifications um before you even you know go to the experience part of your resume and just put a bullet, you know, um, successfully implemented an applicant tracking system with a cross-functional team um, called Jobvite or whatever. Uh, so then you have that keyword uh, Jobvite and, you know, if, if they're looking for applicant tracking systems experience, it's gonna pop up in the algorithm. Great. Um, one, I keep saying this, one last question. Um, how, what's the percentage that it needs to match, like before it probably gets kicked out? Is it like an 80, 70, like, you know, what? It really depends on who's applied. So when, when you apply to a position that I posted, I'm going to look at the first person who applied because there's some regulations in the defense um, industry called, you know, it's OFCCP. But I'm going to look at the first person. If, if they're not a match, I'm going to, you know, kind of put them on hold in my queue. Um, and then I'm going to go till I find the best three or four candidates. And I'm going to continue to work until I find the best four. So you could, you could be applicant 10 and still be considered. It just depends on the number of applicants before you and what they brought. Um, and so I don't disposition all of the time until I get, you know, the top three and a silver medalist that I can consider. Um, so if you're 80% there, 
I'm going to save you in my queue because I may have to go back and look at you again. Great, great. Well, Kara, this has been great. Um, I do want to say that um, if you go, if people go back and watch Jason's session called Finding Potential Job Opportunities, there were some sites in there that you can put your resume in, put the job description in. It'll do a cross reference and tell you what the percentage is. So um, go back to that session and uh, he talks about that program in there and it's free to do like I think once a day or twice a day or something like that. So that is a, a helpful, helpful site. So thank you so much, Karen. This has You're been welcome. fabulous. Been thank pleasure. you everybody. Yeah, so um, let's see. Um, General Electric Credit Union and the Xavier Leadership Center, thank you for joining us today. And we hope you're walking away with things that can put, you can put in place immediately. You will receive an email with a printable card and takeaway message and a survey about your experience. And as always, we welcome all of the feedback. To sign up for the next webinar or to listen to the recordings, please visit gecreditunion.org or xavierleadershipcenter.com. Again, I'd like to thank GECU and our presenter Karen today for our partnership in providing these insights to assist you in your job search. We will see you on October 1st for the negotiation and the job search setting with Bonnie Curtis. And um, sadly, that is our last one. So uh, we're excited to see you back and we will um, talk to you next time. Thanks again, Karen. Thank you guys. Have a good day.